Somebody said, you know, it's like you were born in a suit. And I, I was in the menswear business for many, many, many years and was in a suit all the time. And we were sorting through a bunch of photographs after my parents had passed away years ago. And we found all these pictures of myself and my two brothers. And they're in a flannel shirt and I've got a bow tie on and a blazer and okay. spats. And so I was in a suit from the time I was like three years old. I actually started in a retail apparel company back in the Northeast outside of Boston when I was 16 as a stock boy. I didn't know a T-pin from a bank pin. Uh, the manager and I got along really well. He asked me to do a window one time. I was in between uh, semesters in college during the summer, so I did one. Lo and behold, uh, you know, post-college, the company was going to start a visual merchandising department. Uh, back in that time, it was probably called Display back in the uh, 80s, and uh, I joined as a visual coordinator. And I did that for a year and a half, and then I was appointed into the corporate area. So I was assistant director, then I was director, and then corporate director um, by the time I was 25. When you love what you do, you forget about the time of the day. And so I've been a really big believer of 110. 110 is going the extra mile, it's the ability to take something to a place it wasn't. Um, and to do that, you need time to think it through. And so 110 for me is really important. 99 won't cut it. I think it's important to, um, to really think about relevancy in the market and what's happening and thinking beyond. Mm -hmm. And that's why that 110 is important because you have to really push the envelope in everything creatively, how you think about it, how you execute it, where you're going to go with it, and really at the end of the day, what is the guest experience going to be? Right. So you have to climb into the mindset of the end user. Right. And so I used to sit with my creative teams, and quite frankly, I'm sure I drove them crazy. I would sit in a conference room, and I would lean back and look up at the ceiling. And people were like, what are you doing? I said, well, this is what a kid sees in a stroller. That's mm -hmm. all they see. Mm -hmm. So when we did World of Disney in Florida, we did phosphorescent paint and uh, black light technology, and that whole uh, ceiling lit up at night with stars, so there was magic. From so the kids from the of kids' view. point of view. Yeah, yeah. So I always look at it from an infant all the way up to an adult. We that. would create display windows down where a little four year, five-year-old kid would be so that they could see it and interact with it. And yeah. so it's really thinking much about the guest experience at yeah, the end yeah, of the yeah. day. You're all about the glamorous shopping experience you know, in, 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 in retail and everything mm -hmm. else. Let's talk a little bit about that. A shopping experience should be a journey. It shouldn't be about just running in and buying something and leaving. And if you create something compelling enough, then that glamour, that excitement, it's, it's everything. It's the composition, it's the presentation, it's merchandising, it's placement of fixtures, placement of display, windows. It's how you navigate someone through a space. And I've spent a lot of time focused on how I will get a customer to think about something much further down uh, the environment than they're seeing, but it locks in their mind. Mm -hmm. And so they're visual cues, and visual cues lead people to places. Right. So, so really where important. would MGM, like an MGM experience? So, you know, now MGM, it's really interesting. You know, I went from uh, really an entire retail portfolio um, most of my career, and then when I went to MGM Resorts, uh, it was all about the entire experience. So now I had hospitality, I had gaming, uh, we did the corporate jets, we did spas, salons, celebrity restaurants, rooms, suites, villas, penthouses. It, it's a completely different uh, mindset. Now you are really creating the experience from the front door or even before the front door, the arrival statement, the landscape that right. leads you up to the building, and then that first aha when the doors open. And so it's got to be a wow. Uh, and I think that's why people you know, go uh, to Las Vegas uh, and to the gaming industry, because there's a big aha, and there's a huge journey. You'll notice when you check into a hotel, the elevator is never near the check-in desk. Mm -hmm. It pushes you all the way through the journey yeah. to get to the elevator, and there's reasons behind that. Disney was big. Disney's big with you, obviously, 
and, uh, and your world and your journey. So let's talk a little bit about the Fifth Avenue store. We took Fifth Avenue over and completely reinvented it. We put a theater up on the third floor. Uh, it was magical. It was a place where little girls could come dressed yeah, in costumes and meet uh, Cinderella and Prince Charming. Um, and so we really brought the theme park experience really into the world here. And so I'll tell you a funny story. So we, uh, we closed Fifth Avenue. Um, we moved the small ponies up from Walt Disney World with the carriage for Cinderella. Yeah. And it took a couple of weeks because the ponies are pretty special. They have a special diet and they really have to move uh, cautiously. So we clo closed Fifth Avenue at five o'clock in the middle of the week. I remember. And the carriage came up Fifth Avenue um, with Cinderella and Prince Charming and they came out on the red carpet and that was the ribbon cutting for the opening of the wow. new space. It so was, a little magic. It was such a great location and it was such a magical thing for Fifth Avenue because we've, we watched Fifth Avenue change, mm -hmm. you know, from one, one era to another era to another. So to finally get the Disney store there with Mickey and Minnie up on top of the, what's this, what was the story? With so the, there's a story behind that. So uh, the Fifth Avenue Commission is very particular about facades on buildings. And uh, so we had some challenges in how we were going to meet those needs. So I ended up uh, working with our attorneys for months and months. And I said, these have to be on the building before the chairman comes to visit for the opening. And we got them up two days before the opening of the store. You, you know, the whole thing with Disney is sprinkling Tinkerbell's pixie dust around. So if you could sprinkle some pixie dust on, on, on this world, on this magical world. I think the pixie dust is this. And it's not about a rosy set of lenses because we deal with so many different things in the world. But the fact of the matter is being a little bit kinder and being a little bit gentler and taking the time to listen to someone and hopefully have a solution and feedback is really important. One thing I've learned over the years, if you have the ability to touch someone and you don't, then you've wasted that opportunity. So I have a really simple mantra every single day. I'm going to learn one thing, I'm going to teach one thing, and then I'm going to touch one person. Over 30 years, that's like a, almost 11,000 people. Perfect. So 11,000 things to learn, 11,000 things to think, to teach, and 11,000 people to impact. And we don't think of it. One still makes a difference.